Hello, I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners. I want to welcome everyone today to the EMX Royalty Corps Town Hall Call. Um, I hope you get some great information today. EMX is um, traded on the TSX Venture un under EMX and also EMX on the a symbol on the New York Stock Exchange uh, for use uh, on the American New York Stock Exchange. For those that are new to um, these broadcasts, O&M Partners is based in New York, and we're in the business of bringing public companies and investors together in real time. We're not commissioned, we're not broker-dealer, we're a communications company, and our team comes from a marketing background. Um, the information presented today is already publicly available. We're hoping this broadcast will bring this information to your awareness, clarify context, and help you make a better informed and wiser investment decision. Before we turn to our host today, David Cole, we're going to um, we're going to start with um, kind of the view from 30,000 feet. Uh, there's renewed interest in the mining industry, and here to catch us up um, is David Morgan. Uh, excuse me, David Smith. Excuse me. He's a senior analyst for the Morgan Report. He's a contributor to Money metals.com um he has investigated metals mines and exploration mines and exploration sites in argentina chile peru mexico bolivia china canada and the u.s um and he's here to share his uh, views um with the conference attendees and uh, we welcome him very much thank you for coming david It's great to be back at O&M Partners again to speak with you today. Today, we're going to be talking about the royalty streamer model and why your portfolio needs at least one of them. Little disclaimer here that we always present at the beginning. Explorers help restock the resource and reserve pipelines of the majors. Producers deliver the goods to the market. And a royalty company provides funding to build a mill, expand the mine, harvest the ore, or discover new greenfield deposits. Phil Sheriff, executive chairman of Golden Predator, made this comment on one of an earlier O&M presentations, and I think he's right on the money. And he asked the question, why are royalties outperforming almost every other type of mining concept right now? It's because they generate revenue for themselves as opposed to spending other people's money by drilling, and financing again and drilling some more and eventually having a very bloated share structure. And he's right that this model really, is, if it's not broken, it's very close to. And companies that do this as opposed to generating revenue while they're looking for something uh, really are not going to be doing much service to shareholders going forward, even as this bull market moves forward rapidly, which it's doing as we speak. The definition of a royalty and a streamer are a bit different, but today we're gonna to use the terms interchangeably. Uh, they really, the difference has to do with how they acquire the um, financing and how they receive uh, on their part of the bargain, which is slightly different, but they are complementary to each other. And indeed, royalty companies can use streamer model and vice versa. The central difference is that uh, both of them hold uh, a number of different types of, of uh, resource sector uh, items. The most common and popular are gold and silver and uh, copper, but you also have uh, royalties that deal in base metals and even coal or uranium. And probably the first uh, company to come up with the royalty concept was Franco Nevada, and they have been massively successful. Uh, and what's interesting about this concept, and I'd like to have people consider this throughout the talk is that the royalty uh, concept is extremely versatile and it is having constant new iterations being put in all the time by the participants. A real structured royalty company has a mix of current or near-term production and occasionally some exploration properties that might be brownfield, which would be 
on the, a known property area where production is already taking place, or greenfield where we're looking for something that we don't know it's even there yet. So quite a, quite a mix that you can have in a well-structured royalty company. The basic difference then I wanna mention about a royalty structure is that they finance a program with upfront payments and they get a percent of the sales of the revenue versus the actual goal from the hope for production. And this can be for a certain number of years or it can be life of mine, which in the trade we call LOM. So keep in mind that the royalty is the right to a percentage of the proceeds from the miner's sale of the metal going forward. The streamer model is a little bit different. They can also help finance a mine or mill construction. And in return, they receive a stream, which is a specific number of physical gold or silver ounces per year at an agreed upon price. The most well-known of the streamers and one of the earliest ones really was Silver Wheaton, which is now called Wheaton, Met uh, Wheaton Precious Metals. And they stream a number of different uh, companies uh, using this concept where they buy the future gold production at a steep discount to the current spot price in order to pay money for the mining operation. And then when they get that metal, they sell it at the, in the open market at whatever rate the prevailing rate is. And when the market is rising, like we're seeing uh, currently now where silver and gold are attempting to break out into new nominal highs for this move, um, they can make extra money beyond what they anticipated. And so a rising market can really fatten the coffers of a royalty company when they have a streaming model like this. We want to look at the advantages <clears throat> that having a royalty in your portfolio uh, provides to the investor. There are a number of them. If you just hold a mining company, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong. A mine shaft can collapse. You can have a uh, run out of ore. There was a silver company recently that has going to sell a project because they have no more ore in that one. Uh, you, can have, uh, uh, you can have country risk. Any number of things can happen. The grades can drop. But if you have a, a royalty company, they have a series of companies that are, uh, have a contract to pay them a certain amount or give them a certain amount of metal. And it doesn't matter to them what happens to the mining company, they still get by contract what they've been promised. And so the investor is shielded and so is the royalty company from many of the risks that would accrue from simply having a mining company or an exploration company. They have diversification. There's not just one or two mining companies in the royalty. They can be 10 or 15 or more. And so that spreads out the risk. You have risk uh, mitigation in terms of social or political or operational surprises. Um, mining uh, royalties have much lower overhead and they have a, a surprisingly small workforce with a high dollar performance per employee. And they can plow that money back because they're making income into buying additional royalties for the portfolio, or they can even sell a royalty. Sometime down the line, you might even find that a royalty company starts paying dividends. But the key thing is that they're bringing in money now, not at some imagined time in the future of one, two, three, four years ahead. Royalty streaming operational cautionaries, you know, there's always some risk involved. Uh, you have to be careful and balance out political risk versus the blue sky anticipation. Uh, you can have post-contract signing issues where uh, there's a geologic operational risk. If you have a market downturn, which we went through several years ago and kind of coming out of that now, you can have a cash flow problem with the miner. It's really important that the miner under contract and the streamer itself does due diligence. Uh, they need to make sure they're getting what they think they're going to get and that it actually works out as they plan. The Morgan Report likes certain iterations of the royalty model. For one thing, it avoids what I call the ETF listing curse, where you have uh, companies that are in an ETF, and if the company does really well, it becomes too large for the ETF in terms of a percentage overall basis. And so they'll sell a bunch of their shares in order to bring it back into alignment, which you can imagine hurts the shareholder who has that company, which suddenly now doesn't have much uh, high uh, prices it did before. Whereas a royalty doesn't have that kind of an issue because they basically have their own ETF, so to speak. Um, you have backyard country risk mitigation. Uh, if you have a royalty company that primarily invests in what I would call politically safe, uh, con low country risk areas, especially US, Canada, Australia, and Europe are the most pronounced ones. 
they don't all have to be there, but uh, your core positions ideally should be there to kind of keep things stable for you and the shareholder. Um, also in these areas, uh, the geology tends to be better understood and the rule of law is paramount. And those are very, very important in terms of you getting not only a return on your money, but a return of your money. So the, ideally the, uh, perf the perfect um, streamer royalty model is scalable and sustainable. It can start at very, very tiny and it can go up and, and it should be able to scale up to from pennies, uh, penny uh, share type thing with well under a dollar to many, many dollars if the model is set up properly, sometimes beyond what you can imagine. And I would suggest that investors look at the agreement structure that the royalty company has on their website before you invest and make sure that you know what you're getting and they'll give you a good idea in addition to talking to IR as to what they're all about and their plans that they have in mind. The timing is just right for the royalty company and for people who invest in them because as this chart shows, the relationship between gold and the um, shares themselves, the mining shares, is really out of whack and has been for many years, but there are indications that mining shares are going to begin outperforming the metal as they should of gold and silver uh, going forward. And this will really uh, go to the bottom line for the royalty companies and for the shareholders of those companies as we get that kind of outperformance, which by definition they should be doing because of a little bit of extra risk over the metal itself. And I think this is going to become the theme of the next few years, which is just one more big tailwind for the royalty concept and the shareholders who participate in them. David Morgan has a monthly letter. I've been an analyst at the Morgan Report for about 15 years. I really believe in this uh, company uh, that, he, that he has. And uh, we have more uh, mining companies that have gone on from explorer status to mining, uh, actually becoming a mining company than anybody else in the business. And we will really treat you well. I really enjoy our shareholder base. And I think you will too, if you would like to take a look at his value proposition. And I'd like to thank O&M Partners for giving me this opportunity to speak today. And I wish everyone here the very, very best as we go forward on this very, very exciting bull run that should run for at least the next three to five, perhaps 10 years. Thank you, David, very much. Thank you for setting context for us. It's really important. Um, now we're gonna turn to our host, Dave Cole. Dave is the uh, president, CEO, and director of EMX Royalty. Um, Dave worked internationally for 18 years for Newmont. Um, and he's known um, as a real collaborator. He's known for engaging the smartest minds in the business to execute EMX's uh, unique business model, which of course is based on macro trends in the business. Um, it's a real pleasure to be working for Dave. And um, I wanna turn the call over to him, but I also wanna mention we've got Scott Close on the line with us who handles investor relations for EMX and um, is a great person to contact as well for your questions. Uh, Dave, over to you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dave Manny. Always my pleasure to be here. I'd just like to point out that for, I'm guessing of the 100 plus folks that are on the line right now that um, a number of them have heard me speak before. We're gonna go through some of the bread and butter aspects that we always do when we talk about this business the unique business model and how we organically grow a royalty portfolio and have for many years. But there are some good nuggets of new information since the last time that I gave an update through your uh, platform, Dave, as well as other um, presentations that I've given. And, and those nuggets are contained uh, in the presentation as we go on. So if you're a, a longtime shareholder, a longtime listener to what we have to say, uh, hold on and, and you'll see some good things forthcoming. The, um, Trying to see how we get to advance this. Here we go. So um, everybody knows I love to talk about our business model. It's a unique aspect of the company. It's really what defines us in this business. And it revolves around some of those key aspects that Dave Smith was talking about of royalty companies. But also, you know, I'd like to highlight how we've specifically approached that in a unique manner as a bread and butter royalty generator. The bulk of the royalties in our portfolio were generated through the prospect generation process, whereby we acquire prospective mineral rights around the world. We add value by building economic geologic models. 
We then sell those off to well-funded junior companies and major companies. We like to do both types of those deals all around the world. And uh, we keep a variety of payments. We keep uh, work commitments on the projects. We keep um, um, lease payments tied to advancement, commonly share payments for deals done with junior companies, uh, annual advanced royalty payments or lease payments tied to the projects, stage gate payments when resources are defined or other milestones are achieved, and always on the back end, a production royalty. And those royalties are typically gross royalties. They're all gross royalties, in fact. And we've been doing this for, for 16 plus years around the world with a fantastic exposure of ever increasing portfolio of mineral rights. To augment that organic growth, which is our bread and butter, we also buy royalties. And the royalty acquisition identification is done by the same group of people that are out there around the world doing the royalty generation. So there's excellent synergies between these three prongs of our business. And buying royalties is a tough job. Royalties trade at a premium, and there's some specific reasons relating to, to uh, optionality embedded in a royalty document. I like to say that royalties are phenomenal financial instruments, and we'll go into some of that in a minute. And so they trade at a premium, so it's difficult to, to just go out and buy royalties and instantly create a royalty company. There's some competitors of ours that are doing that, and, and they're, they're, they're absolutely overpaying in most cases for the royalties that they're buying. So you want to be very cautious about that and the share issuance associated with just going out and buying existing royalties. It's vastly more astute allocation of capital to grow royalties organically through the prospect generation process and then sit back and, and pick off royalties that we see that are good value. Uh, largely also based upon our economic geologic acumen and business acumen from having done this for um, you know, a decade and a half, almost two decades around the world. And then the very same uh, business people that are working around the world doing these, these royalty acquisitions and royalty generation occasionally come across an opportunity to make a strategic investment. And um, our filter there is that, is that we only invest in other companies when you cannot not buy the stock. Um, and so we have a very high filter. That has resulted in a phenomenal track record of on our invested capital in our strategic investments over our 16 year history with a 40% internal rate of return on invested capital after tax, uh, which is extraordinary. And of course, there's a couple of big outsized gains that drive those, drive those numbers. Um, but uh, that's put us in a position where we have uh, you know, a substantial amount of money in the bank, uh, eight plus $80 million in working capital, no debt, um, in addition to the 2.3 million acres of mineral right exposure that we have around the world. And this is our global map, and, and, and we focus on different parts of the world at different times. Right now, we're quite active at growing our copper and gold portfolio in the Western United States. We have over 9,000 mining claims uh, um, of exposure. That would include things we own 100%, in addition to things that have been sold, where we have a royalty, in addition to royalties that we've purchased. Uh, throughout the uh, uh, Western US with a strong holding in the gold fields of Nevada, a key new property that we have there is a strategic investment in Rawhide. And I'm going to go in and talk about that. That was a recent acquisition on our part, and that will become a dividend cash flowing strategic investment um, that we're very excited about giving us direct exposure to a, a very successful long-term district in Nevada at Rawhide. We have, we're, we're, we're the third largest mineral rights holder in the state of Arizona with large land holdings in and around the big copper belts there, operated, operated by some of the largest mining companies in the world and our, our, and our counterparties to our royalty agreements um, that have come out of our organic growth are some of the biggest mining houses in the world. But for the last several years, we've been quite active in Northern Europe. We believe the geology there is excellent. The mining laws in these countries are excellent. Sweden has 17 major operating mines, seven smelters. Uh, that's uh, 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 six more than there are in the United States, I believe. So the um, uh, uh, we found these countries to be very good places to work, uh, very good free data available through the geological surveys of the countries which we can leverage into geological understanding, which we leverage into property ownership, and then ultimately into deals where we sell these projects on. And you've seen a number of deals that we've done throughout our history there, including one that was announced uh, yesterday, um, the day before yesterday, where, where uh, we sold additional projects with battery metal potential, copper and cobalt and nickel 
um, on those projects. So some of our uh, value drivers in the company are in Serbia. We have a royalty on the Timuk Magmatic Complex, uh, the, the big, huge advancing Timuk mine there, one of the largest ongoing copper and gold development projects in the world. We've been uh, uh, working for many, many, many years in Turkey, and, and um, we'll talk a bit about the, our Turkish portfolio. Is there a 2.3 million acres of mineral right exposure around the planet? And so if we put those onto this pyramid as a way to illustrate their level of advancement, starting off at, at uh, brand new grassroots uh, projects at the base of this pyramid that we've acquired. Um, then when we sell them, they're being entirely advanced with other people's money, not, not, other, not our shareholders' money. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our the counterparty's money, Newmont's money or Freeport's money or any number of the junior companies that we've worked with. And all the, all the ones which are stars on this pyramid are paying royalties. The vast majority of those are pre-production payments, but we built into the deals when we sold those that there are significant and typically advancing pre-production payments tied to that. So a significant amount of our portfolio is cash flowing. Um, and then very importantly, been a focus of ours is to increase the production royalties and producing assets at the top of the pyramid to enhance our cash flow. If you've heard me speak over the course of the last couple of years, I've continued to pound the table about how we're focusing on increasing cash flow to augment what is a fantastic long-term uh, optionality and potential within this pyramid. And so this is a great time to talk about optionality and about why that makes royalty instruments phenomenal financial instruments. So embedded in this in this um, diagram is an immense amount of commodity price optionality, which many of the folks who invest in our sector like to have. They like to have gold price optionality. They like copper price optionality into the future. But and, and that's a driver of royalty valuation for sure. But the most important driver of royalty valuation long term, when we look at some of the big huge royalties that are paid, such as uh, Dave Smith talked about Franco Nevada, you know, they're one of their very best royalties they acquired early on is now paid over a billion dollars. And that was on the gold strike mine in Nevada. Um, of course, nobody knew it would pay a billion dollars, a little over a million dollars for it many years ago, decades ago. Um, and, and they won huge on that thanks to discovery optionality. And that is that the operator continues to invest money in the ground. They continue to, to ascertain the geology and figure out where the potential is and grow the resources, grow the reserves. The metallurgists figure out how to get more gold out of the rock. The engineers figure out how to mine more inexpensively, all to the royalty holder's benefit. And so when you get a royalty on a big district, these things can become monstrous cash payers for decades. And it's the potential for those to emanate from our pyramid that really drives the value and that underlying fundamental optionality of our portfolio. So uh, I'm a firm believer in, in the immense amount of optionality within the portfolio, but a lot of our shareholders and, and management and the board of directors feel that we have to have additional cash flow at the top of the pyramid as well. And so that's been a focus for us is to put populate the top of the pyramid with cash flow today to balance and show the investor that we're getting cash flow now, that cash flow is increasing. Um, in addition to the, the assets from within that pyramid, just working their way up, thanks to the astute investment on behalf of our counterparties to advance those towards production. And Accord, uh, Akarja, Sisorda um, are advancing towards production. Bali is just now coming in to, to full-scale commercial production. We put out a press release not that long ago about Balia where a new operator has come in that owns a 5,000 ton per day mill. And we're about to see uh, um, a substantial increase in the production at Balia, which is a lead zinc silver royalty in um, Turkey. Leeville now operated by Nevada Gold Mines um, is, a, is a great example. That royalty has paid over $13 million since we've owned that. And, and Barrick, who's the operator of the Nevada Gold Mines joint venture between Newmont and Barrick, has just come out with a, a press release uh, last few days uh, discussing the additional potential that they've identified within the greater Leeville area, speaking once again to this concept of discovery optionality. So um, we're a globally diversified company. We have bounced around the world um, taking advantage of, of business acumen, geological knowledge, 
gaps in um, uh, political risk assessment um, around the world. You know, we, we've been to crazy places like Haiti. At one point in time, we controlled 11% of the mineral rights of Haiti and the Massif de Nord, a fantastic geologic belt there. Just as an example, we sold all that to Newmont Mining Corporation for 4 million US dollars cash on the barrel head and half percent royalty, and Newmont's now advancing that. Just as one um, end member example of, of us executing the business model. Uh, in, in recent times, when the capital markets have been chilly, and it's, and it's been difficult to, for our competitors and exploration companies around the world. We've taken advantage of that by moving into top tier countries such as Sweden and the United States and, and increased our land ownership there. And that's resulted, uh, put us in a position where uh, we've had excellent deal flows. We've been able to sell those assets on to, to counterparties that are hungry for new discovery opportunities to feed their pipelines as producing companies and advancing exploration companies. From a commodity uh, perspective, uh, we continue to diversify here, but I will say that we have augmented substantially our gold exposure with our purchase of rawhide. And I'm delighted, I love gold. I think gold's a great commodity to be exposed to all the time. And uh, our long-term outlook on copper is fabulous. We're, we're delighted to have exposure to some of the biggest uh, new copper development projects around the world, specifically the Timuk project in Serbia. And um, but we have lots of other copper exposure in Arizona and elsewhere in the world um, as well. And then the term here, polymetallic, is a, um, a catch-all for a number of deposit styles. Some are copper, cobalt, nickel. Some are uh, lead, zinc, silver. Some are zinc, copper. But in different uh, uh, systems, uh, geological systems that have multiple metals within them. Many of those have battery metal components, which has been a focus of ours. As a lot of folks are long-term bullish on battery metals. And so we've seen excellent deal flow from that side of the, of the uh, uh, pie diagram as well. And then um, as we've executed this business and sell projects off and turn grassroots projects into royalties, uh, we now have 48% of our portfolio is in royalty status. We also have a healthy number of projects that we're currently out marketing to an industry that, that is hungry for good assets. We see we see strong customer interest in good copper projects, battery metal projects, and always there's a market for good gold properties. It's interesting in our history, we've cycled through over 5 million acres of mineral rights. We have 2.3 million acres um, on the books and uh, uh, that continues to grow. The team that has built this uh, portfolio is firing on all cylinders. And that's one of the other optionality aspects, if you will, to being an EMX shareholder is you're not just buying the existing portfolio, but that portfolio that, that these smart folks uh, that I have the opportunity to work with continue to grow. Um, so one of, not only do we have these um, uh, very intelligent folks inside the company, the, 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 one of the great aspects of this business model, coming back to Dave Smith's comments about royalty companies, is that we get the money from all the folks that are our counterparties here, Newmont, Rio Tinto, some of the largest mining houses in the world, Anglo-American, um, that we have worked with and do work with uh, over the years, uh, as well as a bunch of junior companies and private companies in Turkey, et cetera. We get their money going into the ground, which is great. That's, to, that's leveraging our position and our royalty portfolio, but we also get their expertise. I'm delighted to have Newmont Money Corporation's expertise helping with the social issues in Haiti as one example. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have South 32's expertise in advancing the the um, uh, lead zinc silver discovery that we have a piece of in Arizona at Taylor as another example. So we get their, their, their expertise, we get their money, and um, um, just, just uh, you know, another good aspect of, um, of advancing the business model. So with respect to share ownership, um, management directors, employees are over 15 and percent. That number's increased over the years. And uh, um, that's from uh, insider buying on my part, as well as uh, as well as some some new folks who've come in as advisors to the company that are large large shareholders. Importantly, our working capital number, which I mentioned as of the end of last quarter, is 81 million dollars, and that's uh, thanks to uh, us being astute with our our capital allocation and some nice wins coming from our strategic investments. If you look at our securities number. And I was just talking to my CFO before the before we got on the call here, saying that that, that securities number that's on this slide, 3.x, 
seems a little low to me. And that's because those are just the tradable securities. If we include our long-term investments in other companies, such as in Rawhide, such as the recent deal that came out with Encero Environmental, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, that number is 13 million Canadian dollars uh, that we have um, of uh, securities within our portfolio and speak to our ability to create value for our shareholders through all three prongs, through strategic investing, royalty purchase, and um, uh, our organic growth through prospect generation and royalty generation, which you know that is our core business. And I will say that, that we've been quite aggressive in the Western United States and Scandinavia at acquiring more mineral rights. We think those are great places to work. We're searching and looking at other venues around the world. We've been uh, more active in Idaho recently. We're taking a look at some other states um, and uh, um, some countries that I don't want to name yet because I, we see some low-hanging fruit to take to take advantage of. But you know, we're, we're always combing the earth, looking for opportunities, utilizing our business acumen and geological skill sets to find that pers prospective mineral rights to acquire and enhance uh, to feed to the industry. 9,000 mining claims in the West United States, huge property positions right in the heart of the copper fields um, in Arizona. These are have uh, counterparties that would include Kennecott, which is the exploration arm of Rio Tinto Zinc, one of the largest mining companies in the world. We worked with BHP, uh, we worked with Anglo American, we worked with uh, we worked with um, uh, South 32, another multi-billion dollar um, company. Uh, that we have a regional strategic alliance with uh, over a three-state area uh, looking specifically for large copper systems. We love these types of deals. We love to do repeat business with them. We've done six deals in the last four years with, uh, with Rio Tinto, for example. Once we establish a rapport with these guys, they know we do good work. We know what types of deals uh, the, 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 you know, both sides of the, of the agreement have to have in order to get a deal to work. And uh, so that can accelerate deal flow and make it easier to do um, repeat business. And we love to do repeat business. We love to take good care um, of our customers. So one of the, one of the exciting new um, assets that we have within the portfolio, it's not a royalty, it's a strategic investment, but it's a strategic investment specifically geared towards immediate cash flow. And that is a 19.9% .9 interest in Rawhide, Rawhide is uh, operated by former Rio Tinto people that, that that back when this mine was owned by Rio Tinto, and um, they've done a great job at, at continuing to extract value out of this historic district that's produced uh, um, uh, close to two million ounces of gold uh, equivalent. It's a combination of gold and silver. It's it's in a fantastically workable part of Nevada, right in the heart of mining country, and uh, we're very pleased to be here. There's a new satellite mine that is now in production called Regent that we're quite bullish on based upon our technical analysis, which was fairly in-depth. And uh, um, this uh, LLC has a track record of paying dividends and it's specifically written into the bylaws of the LLC that half of the taxable income has to be distributed on a quarterly basis. And then the other half is distributed at the end of the year. Uh, and the, uh, there's a 43101 report being done on the new mine and on an, an update on the project, which when complete will put me in a situation where I can legally talk about the specific numbers and guidance that we expect to see from this investment. Unfortunately, I know what the numbers are, but I'm not allowed to talk about it until we have a 43101 compliant um, uh, document, but that is forthcoming. I believe that that should be done within a few months, and then we'll be able to give the market guidance with respect to what we believe is going to be very, very, very strong dividend flow here uh, from our investment, augmenting the top of the pyramid, uh, which, as you know, is is uh, a clear objective of mine and, and the board of uh, EMX. Um, one of the key assets that's augmented the top of our pyramid for years now is paid $13 million, is the Leeville Royalty. This uh, previously was operated by Newmont. Now it's part of a Newmont Barrick joint venture and operated by Nevada Gold Mines. And Nevada Gold Mines, now operated by Barrick, have put out a couple of different key PowerPoint presentations there, illustrating the immense amount of discovery potential that they see on this property. They continue to enhance the reserves, enhance the resources, and Barrick has specifically come out and talked about the 
drill indicated resource potential on this property and it's a salient number. So I encourage folks to look at that um, cash flowing royalties on the Carlin trend, commonly trade close to NPV zero. Uh, and that is, you might say, my gosh, that doesn't make any sense. How could that be? When I say NPV zero, I'm talking about the net present value of the cumulative incipient cash flow at today's metal price, non-discounted using a zero discount rate. And the reason why gold royalties trade at these high valuations um, um, is because of that embedded optionality, because of things like this where big discoveries can be made. Um, and uh, you know, we're delighted to see the, the $300 million vent shaft, uh, which enhanced the underground infrastructure on the property substantially completed. We're happy to see that Barrick as the operator of Nevada Gold Mines is taking this asset very seriously. The fact that they're highlighting it amongst all their assets that they have around the world is uh, indicative of what they feel about the project for sure. So key asset of ours um, that we expect this to continue to cash flow well into the future. This diagram shows our royalty footprint. It shows some of the recent drill holes that they have they have announced. Um, I always like to to uh, see some of these drill holes. There's there's uh, 10 meters of 16 grams. That's a pretty good hit. How about 15 meters of 23 grams per ton? Uh, so you know, they, you know they just keep finding more gold here and. Um, now with three shafts and a couple of declines accessing, com completely enhancing the underground infrastructure, this is going to be an asset that will pay for many, many, many years into the future. Um, another example is this discovery that that um, uh, South 32 purchased from Arizona Mining for over a billion dollars, and that's in the Taylor District. Um, the uh, this was a project that we sold at the bottom of the market many years ago. Didn't think that much of it at the time. It was a, it was a, you know, sort of an average property. We thought we sold it. We kept a two percent uncapped, unbuyable royalty. Um, all of our royalties uh, have some aspect of them that, that cannot be bought out in perpetuity. And um, lo and behold, uh, Arizona Mining and now South 32 have advanced a huge lead zinc silver discovery here. And they've drilled substantial thicknesses of, of robust grade um, that straddle the border onto our 2% ground illustrated on this map. And we're quite bullish about the extension of that mineralization onto our property. This is uh, uh, an asset that came from the, you know, the very bottom of our pyramid and looks like it will bubble up and become one of the key value drivers in the company in years ahead. And is a great example of that optionality that I like to talk about that's embedded in our portfolio. All of that work is at no expense to EMX. That's all operator funded, of course, but just to remind everybody of that. So um, uh, another not too distant uh, in the past deal that we've completed that we're proud of is a deal that we did in the Good Pastor District around the Pogo Mine in Alaska. And we've acquired through a couple of different transactions that were part equity, corporate equity, in addition to royalty purchasing, we were able to put together a, a 235,000 acre percent, that's acres of mineral rights times percent royalty, because there's a very number of, of royalty, and you can see in this diagram, some 1%, some 1.5%, some 2%, some 3% uh, deals within that, but it accumulates out to 235,000 acre percent, um, a huge footprint, and, and this is now all in a joint venture being advanced by a cashed up Australian company working with Millrock. We think Millrock's an excellent prospect generator. We're delighted to be a key shareholder in Millrock. We're one of Millrock's largest shareholders now. I believe on a partially diluted basis, we're 12% we're, um, or more um, equity holder in Millrock. And, and we're delighted to have that. We think that Greg Weischer is doing a fabulous job here executed an excellent deal with the new company coming in. They are planning to spend $5 million over the course of the forthcoming year exploring, and they've got some hot prospects right across the border um, there at Pogo and, and the Western on the Western trend coming across onto our royalty footprint. So we're excited about that as a good asset for us. But um, um, you know, as exciting as, as those all are, uh, they pale in comparison to the potential of this one. Um, early in the history of EMX, we went into Serbia. We helped the Serbian government rewrite their money law. We helped them write their concession law. We became the first foreign company to be granted 
an exploration license in Serbia in over 40 years. We opened the door for, for foreign investment in the sector in Serbia. Um, and that was kind of a tense time, I'll have to tell you. It was a little bit tricky working in Serbia at that point in time. I was, I was uh, uh, in Belgrade at the time working uh, on this many years ago and happy to have the fruits of our labor really paying off here where we ended up with a portfolio of royalties throughout the Timuk Magmatic Complex, including a one half of 1% royalty over the huge discovery at Chukuru Peki on the Brestovac license, commonly known as the Timuk Project. And that's now being advanced by Xinjiang. Um, and they are fast tracking this to production. They've signed a memorandum of understanding with the Serbian government to invest $474 million. The, this new picture of the head frame, that's the new head frame uh, that has been just recently built. We just got this picture um, a couple of weeks ago. And that's in addition to a spiral decline that's rubber tired, decline that's going into the upper zone um, of the mineralization there. To, to produce some of the highest grade mineralization first, based upon the feasibility study that was filed on this project previously, we expect to see two and a half million dollars in annual income once in production from the upper zone. But the upper zone is a, is a small but high grade zone. The real potential for this royalty to become gigantuan, a big pair, is when they do get into the lower zone, which is the porphyry zone. That's over a billion tons at over 1% copper equivalent. Uh, making it you know, a gigantuan development project, and um, um, yeah, the, the 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 potential income from that lower zone um, is salient. Uh, you know, multiples of what we sh will see from the upper zone, and this is a key value driver in the company, and one of the reasons why I have continued to buy the stock over the course of uh, the last five six years. Now you've seen my trades as they are reported. And one of the key reasons why I've done that is to believe in the whole business model. But this this value driver right here is a, is a significant reason why you want to be exposed to EMX Royalty Corporation. Probably the largest next uh, earliest cash flow, big cash flow and royalty for us, however, will be the Balia Royalty in Turkey, where we have a 4% royalty, uncapped, unbiable. This is a very high percentage royalty for the mining business. And you can see the stacked zones of lead zinc silver mineralization in the cross section here. This, uh, um, as we press released, uh, this district has now been consolidated with Esson having bought out the previous operator, consolidating the district, which creates excellent synergies with respect to infrastructure. Specifically, Esson has a 5,000 ton per day mill, one kilometer from the head frame. And they are planning on putting in a spiral decline and enhancing the stope development on the project to enhance production. So we expect this to become a multi-million dollar cash line royalty um, within this calendar year, towards the end of the calendar year, and as we work into 2021. Um, so another uh, key reason um, uh, for us to all own this stock, in my opinion, and once again, focusing on enhancing the cash flow of the company at the top of the pyramid. So we've been quite active in Norway and Sweden. We're, we're extraordinarily large mineral rights holders here. We're the largest mineral right holder in Norway, the second largest mineral right holder in Sweden, um, just after Boliden, who has been in the country for generations. And gold projects, lead zinc silver projects, battery metal projects, including nickel, copper, cobalt, some with gold and platinum group element credits associated with those. And we've seen good deal flow here. We continue to, to sell these projects on in exchange for cash, shares, and royalties, augmenting our portfolio. We also have a copper project that's uh, joint ventured with one of our favorite customers, South 32, um, as, as an example. So uh, been a good place for us to work. This, this next one I'm going to talk about was uh, just announced. And I... I you know, talk about optionality. I believe there's just some fantastic optionality embedded in this deal. And this is a real lateral think. And it comes back to one of the core values that I've had in building EMX Realty Corporation in the beginning, and that is investing in super smart people. Uh, Jim Harrington, who's the CEO and founder of Encero, previously Alexco Environmental Group, is a aqueous chemist genius. 
and has pioneered new methodologies for processing uh, acid mine drainage and polluted waters around the world and has a fabulous reputation. They pulled off something fantastic in the Yukon whilst they were part of Alexco, a, a good mining company in the Yukon. Uh, they came across a, a, a dirty district um, and they cleaned it up. And by cleaning it up, they made the community happy. They made the First Nations people happy. They made the government of Canada happy. And they unlocked the mineral potential of that project. And uh, that's now Keno Hill, um, an active silver producer. Alexco has moved on to focus on their silver mining and good for them. And the environmental group, which was built inside of that entity, wanted to go private. So we have uh, financed in part that effort and consequently become a nice equity holder uh, with, uh, uh, with Ancero, whose Alexco Environmental Group has been renamed Ancero. Um, and so the optionality that we have built into this is the payments, immediate cash flow, coming back to cash flow again, top of the pyramid. We get immediate cash flow from the, um, from the shares that we purchased, which are preferred shares, which have a preferred dividend coming back to us, as well as a double principal payment due in year six and year seven. So there's some nice upside for us just on a cash basis. In addition to a 7.5% equity position in this dynamic company. And then most importantly, from my perspective, is a strategic alliance with these guys where we can look at brownfield opportunities that we have in our vest pocket and they have ideas as well. We're gonna put our intelligence together and look for other opportunities where we can clean up bad environmental situations and unlock significant mineral potential um, in the Western United States and Western Canada. So I'm pretty excited about this deal, immediate cash flow and lots of long-term optionality. So, um, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, you know, we're focused on growing that rev revenue. We're focused on additional dividend and coupon payments coming in, enhancing our cash flow as we move forward, continuing to uh, make money from selling strategic investments and selling assets and, and building that royalty portfolio organically in addition to buying royalties, getting more pre-production payments, all the things you've heard me talk about. Um, and uh, so we're happy to be in a situation today where thanks to having sold our strategic investment in Russia, which netted out to a 69 million US dollars, all those monies are in the bank now. Uh, uh, and we have new strategic investments in Rawhide and Encero now ongoing. Uh, so we continue to operate on that side of our business. Um, so paid off handsomely for us over time, uh, continuing our royalty generation work and our royalty acquisition work with a focus on building cash flow for our shareholders. So that's it uh, for now, David. I know you always have some excellent questions for me. Thank you, Dave. Nice presentation as always. Yes, we're gonna start with uh, Chuck O'Reilly today. Chuck, any questions for Dave Cole? I'm sorry, I was not expect. I didn't have a question. Uh... That's okay, Chuck, you're not on the spot. Just wanted <laughs> to see if the, if the presentation had brought any questions up. Really appreciate your attendance. We're going to turn to Dave Kranzler. Dave. Dave always has a question. Dave always How are you has doing, a question. Dave? I'm doing very well. Good to see you again. Good things going on at the company. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I could spend an hour in the room asking him questions and grilling him, but I'll, I'll, if I could just have two, that would be great. Please. Sounds good. Um, the first thing is, uh, is, is there any way that you could put some sort of numerical definition on the, the Serbian copper royalty, just to so myself and others can have an idea of what we're potentially looking at here? Yeah, so so probably the best way to do that, and and, and I'm bound by by US securities laws and, and Canadian securities. Understood. Specifically 43-101 document uh, um, uh, <coughs> necessities. So I can talk specifically about the 43-101 reserve that's been filed in the upper zone at TMOOC, and so I can tell you that uh, we're expecting $2.5 million per year at roughly today's metal prices from the upper zone based upon that feasibility study. Um, with respect to the lower zone, which is way bigger, right? There's not a 43-101 document that explicitly says 
um, what the production profile is likely to be going forward. So I'm not allowed to talk about that, but you can do the math yourself. Um, it's 1.1 billion tons at, at over a percent. It's 0.99% copper and 0.21 grams per ton gold. And you can assume some metallurgical recovery loss. You can assume that not all the deposit will be mined. You can take a conservative view of that. And you can uh, look at what a half percent royalty is worth over time. Not to mention the fact that as that's mined, of course, the price of gold and copper are not going to stay the same. And um, because that's a deposit that will be mined over a few decades in all probability, right? And also um, almost certainly will grow in size, in my opinion. Last I knew there were 12 drill rigs on site working on expanding that resource above the 1.1 billion ton number. So, but you know, you can do the math. Um, Dave, I bet you have. It's uh, hundreds <laughs> of millions. Yeah, but <laughs> but uh, I can't I can't specifically say what that number is. No, I understand, but that that's definitely helpful, and it's it's certainly easy to to do the math and apply your own assumptions. But yeah. um, and then what what kind of uh, um, timeline are we looking at? And you know, from now yeah. until when it gets advanced into an operating mine. Yeah. So that's that's been defined and announced uh, both by the Serbian government and Xinjiang. Um, it's part of the Memorandum of Understanding signed between Xinjiang and the Serbian government, where Xinjiang committed to to put $474 million in the ground over the course of the next uh, couple of years to enhance the, the underground infrastructure to bring the upper zone into production. So the upper zone will be in production in late 2020 um, and be in full production by late 2021, according to that Memorandum of Understanding. We know that the Chinese um, and Xinjiang have a tendency to be aggressive. So that's to the royalty holders advantage. Uh, they want that metal out of the ground. And um, so we're delighted. The, the, with respect to the lower zone, I don't know what the timeline is specifically. Um, we, we, do, we are staying in touch with people in Serbia. So we have a, a general idea. Of course, as they're developing the underground infrastructure to um, produce the upper high grade zone. It, that, that is enhancing the ability to get into the lower zone. So they're very synergistic with respect because they're connected entities, actually. Both of those deposits are connected. And um, so the underground infrastructure development will be occurring simultaneous to the production of the, excuse me, the lower zone infrastructure will be put in place simultaneous to the upper zone being developed um, all to our advantage. If I had to guess when the lower zone will be in production, I would say five to seven years. But that's a guess. That's that. I, I, I can't specifically say that. Great, thanks. It, it sounds like it's it's potentially more lucrative than Malmish was. Yes, Malmish was a great cash infusion. We're delighted to have those monies in the bank, uh, but but this will pay for decades. Great. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, Dave. We'll turn to Donald Wong. Donald, do you have questions today for Dave Cole? Hi. Thank you very much, Mr. Mandy. And thank you, Mr. Cole, for your time and this opportunity. Can you please tell us more about your current foreign exchange strategy? And what are the main legal differences for mining between European jurisdictions and North America? Thank you. Well, first, the, first, the currency question, Donald, and thanks for the questions. Um, we hold the bulk of our money in the bank right now in USD. We've discussed this at length at the board level, and we believe that USD, uh, which is the, the, the bulk of our worldwide financial commitments that we have are denominated in US dollars. Of course, we have, we have Swedish kroner obligations and we have uh, CAD um, obligations. Uh, so we do we do you know roll money into CAD or into Swedish crowns and uh, other currencies as needed around the world. But the bulk of the money that we have um, is held as USD um, and subject to change. In the past, we have held um, a higher amount of CAD than USD, uh, but right now we're mostly in USD. The board could change their mind if there were reasons to in the future. Uh, but but that's done well for us recently, and we're still in that position. Uh, with respect to the differences in in mining law around the world, um, the uh, the United States and Canada have uh, have great mining law that that allows people to go out and stake claims um, and acquire mineral rights over public property, which has been conducive to robust mineral development in both of those countries. 
and we're we're fully fluent with respect to how that works and we own over 9000 mining claims in the western united states uh, in many other countries around the world it works quite a bit differently usually the government controls those mineral rights and so you acquire the mineral rights through exploration licensing and and production permit licensing through the government and um, Usually there's work commitments associated with that, and sometimes there's payments associated with that, and every country is a little bit different. And uh, certainly all of Europe has not been unitized with respect to the money law there. Every country has a little bit different money law in Europe, but I will say hats off to Sweden. In my opinion, their mining legislation is world-class. Uh, they, they know that mining is a key aspect of their economy and has been throughout history. And um, we find it to be a very transparent and easy to work in environment. They have one of the quickest permitting timelines to production in the world. Thank you, Donald. Those were great questions. Uh, we're gonna turn to John Burke. John, any questions today for David? Yes, uh, yes, David, David and David. Uh, yes, very good presentation. Thank you, David. Uh, has the what is the board's uh, position or, or future uh, plans for dividend policy? Yeah, well, I know what my my plan is. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the uh, uh, you know I, I think it's safe to say that we have decided um, after speaking with our largest shareholders and mulling over this question now for some time that we do not desire to pay a large dividend with the cash that we have in the bank. Um, our shareholders believe that we do an astute job of allocating capital and have a long track record of doing that. They want to see us allocate the monies that we have in the bank growing the company with one of the focuses being on more cash flowing assets at the top of the pyramid. So what does that translate back with respect to dividend strategy? And that is that we would like to institute a small incremental quarterly dividend payment once our ongoing recurring cash flow, not just big wins from strategic investments, but ongoing recurrent cash flow is sufficient to support a quarterly dividend. Um, but as I look at our portfolio and think about uh, when that could happen, um, you know, I, I, I think by 2021 we'll be there. I'd be delighted if it happened sooner, but I don't want to create any false expectations let's say 2021, 2022, we start paying a quarterly dividend. Initially, I would expect that dividend to be quite small with a view towards growing it annually thereafter. Thank you very much. Thank you. John, we're gonna go to Lincoln Rathman. Lincoln, great to have you on the call. Questions today? Yes, I have a question. You know, I, I was fascinated by that pyramid you have with these producing assets on the top. Could you give us an idea of the relative value of that top of the pyramid compared to the rest of it? The, the relative value of the copper within the pyramid as compared to the other commodities within the pyramid? No, that's not my question. You have, you have in the peak of the uh, pyramid things like uh, Rawhide, Leeville, uh, Serbia, whatever. Maybe yeah. Serbia isn't there yet. But so I take it the bottom of the pyramid is, is worth a lot more than what's already producing. Oh, well, that's a fabulous question. So that's, that's a very dynamic answer, actually. There's not a straightforward answer to that. And it, it all depends upon um, what risk factors you want to apply to the earlier stage projects mm -hmm. and what discount rate that you would put on those. And um, so it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I talked about the fact that these phenomenal financial instruments called royalties trade at premiums. They tend to trade at premiums when they're when they're in production or they're near production. And so people can understand and they can see that that has a substantial future cash flow. And in a world where we have negative interest rate bonds out there, which is hard to believe, but it's true, um, you know, cash cash flowing assets trade at a premium. So they they grow immensely in value as they reach the top of the pyramid is what I'm getting to with mm -hmm. respect to the marketability, right? But you know, I just love having that potential for, for those to be created through the base of the pyramid. And, and how you value the base of the pyramid is a very dynamic question um, and because of all the combined risks associated with mineral property advancement 
and then there would be a huge discounter based upon what discount rate you wanted to use to to value those assets. So there's not a straightforward answer, but I will say this. Um, I've heard David Harkul speak about Franco Nevada, um, one of the, the premier royalty company in the world. And he, and he loves to talk about how deep in his portfolio, projects that he didn't even know the names of, ended up becoming huge value drivers. And he talks about that as, as some of the great optionality that's probably not, you know, that's it's probably not recognized specifically within the portfolio. But, so how do you value that? That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Well, I see, I see you're not going to give me a specific answer, but I, I, you know, sure. I, I, I can't because, um, uh, uh, you know, we would have our own modeled estimates, mm -hmm. uh, but we would not be allowed to share those. Yeah. Because right. of, Securities laws. Yep. So you have just a follow up. You have a portfolio that has a certain value, and you also have a staff and a process uh, that also has a value in 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 terms of acquiring future royalties and interests. How, how valuable is that process? Well, and the um, I'm humbled by the extraordinarily intelligent and well-experienced folks I have the opportunity to work with and and uh, I put a huge amount of value on them. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that earlier in the presentation that that um, you, know, you can value us based upon what's in the pyramid already, but don't forget that the team that built that pyramid is smarter than they ever have been and we just continue to grow that pyramid. And so what's the value of that moving forward? Um, we've had a good track record of, of engaging strong contributors and keeping them here. And um, I hope that uh, we, we keep that going into the future. It's a, always been a key focus uh, uh, from the very beginning. So, uh, you know, I built the company, the people first mentality. So we mm -hmm. didn't go to crazy places like Haiti because we wanted to go to Haiti. We went there because we had someone that had unique in-region knowledge that could be leveraged into a portfolio. And the same with Northern Europe and, and the same with uh, um, the strong portfolio that we have in, in Arizona. You know, we have some of the best structural and economic geologists in the Western United States that, um, uh, that uh, you know, actually initially started to build a portfolio as a private prospect generator. And then EMX made a strategic investment into that company called Bronco Creek Exploration and uh, then leveraged uh, their talent into building a portfolio throughout the Western United States uh, and eventually merged Bronco Creek into EMX. So that was a strategic investment that ended up becoming a substantial business unit um, in the company. Uh, but it speaks to this concept of, of people first. Well, congratulations on what you've accomplished so far. I look forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lincoln. We always appreciate your questions, Lincoln. Uh, we're going to turn next to Matt Geiger. Matt, good to have you on the call, Matt. Thanks, David. And uh, appreciate the update, Dave. Um, just sure just thing, one Matt. question uh, for you today. Yes. Um, as you mentioned, you guys have spent, you know, the past seven or eight years uh, consolidating a, an extensive project portfolio up in, in Scandinavia. And over the past couple of years, you've announced deals with Boreal and Goldline, Pursuit, you know, South 32, Playfair. I think there's a couple more names as well. Yeah. Um, can, can you comment on what percentage of your inventory up there is still in the hands of EMX 100% and what percentage has now been uh, optioned out to partners? Yeah, so there was a pie diagram um, earlier in the presentation that showed the unpartnered portion, the portion that we own 100%. I can't remember the exact number. I have to go back and check it. It was just recently updated. I'm going to say it's it's probably around 35% or 40% of the portfolio globally is being marketed. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. that's not an uncommon number for us to be in that range. What it is specifically in Norway and Sweden um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it's probably in that one third to one half range. Great, that's helpful. So, yeah. I guess we can but expect Matt, more can, deals to I come. Can re, I can. Um, the uh, business unit manager is here in the office, so I can I'll, I can find out that and and send that off to you in an email. I'd be interested in that. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, Matt. I don't want to put my friend on the spot, but I was pleased to see that Mike Devshi joined us. Mike, do you have a question today for Dave Cole? First time in the last 57 years, Norway is looking to invest money 
outside of Norway for oil. Okay, and they have all this money. Oh, this is the largest oil company in the world. Right. Bigger than Saudi's. Don't understand him. Did you understand him, Dave? No, but happy to hear your voice, Mike. Glad you're on the call. Um, what 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 can I help? How can I answer any questions for you, Mike? We want to invite people to go in and 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 participate. Okay. Who owns EMX Oil? I think that Mike's on the phone with someone else is what I guessed it. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to mute Mike. Just tried okay. the effort. You no. Know? And then we have one more person, uh, Bill Sheriff, on the line with us. So can't have Bill on the line and not ask him if he has a question. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, Bill how are you doing? Anything to ask, Bill? Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me or not. We can, can. hear you clear, Bill. Uh, that could be dangerous. Uh, no no <laughs> questions. Uh, just keep up the good work. Uh, really applaud the latest move uh, there with the environmental group. Yeah, I appreciate your email on that, Bill. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't sure how the market would react, but we've, we've seen excellent comments back people recognizing the multiple facets of optionality embedded in that environmental deal. But, but thanks for your support on that one. Bet. Thank you, Bill. Good to have you on the call. Um, we've gone through all the questions, Dave. I just want to turn it back to you for closing remarks. We are available to answer questions um, and feel free to reach out to us. Scott Close, the Director of Investor Relations, who's here in the room with me, just loves to talk on the phone and tell the story of the company and answer all the hard questions that come across. For those people that are in the European theater, Isabel um, Belger is available. She's fluent German speaker, fluent English speaker. So feel free to reach out to her um, anytime. And uh, I'm, here as, I'm here also. So um, happy to answer questions for folks as we build the company. Thanks for presenting today, Dave. Thanks for all your help, Scott Close. And I want to thank everyone on the call today uh, for your attendance. And I wish you a very pleasant evening. Take care. Thank you, David.